All right, in this review video, we're going to talk about collecting samples and avoiding bias. So here's the key things you need to know for the AP Stats test. You need to be able to recognize which of four random techniques is used in a problem. So we got to go through the four different ways to select a sample randomly. You got to be able to identify them. You have to be able to recognize which type of bias is seen in a problem. So we're going to go over the different biases. And you have to be able to describe, um, sorry for the little typo there, describe how you would collect a sample with each method. So we're going to talk about each sampling method and how to collect a sample. All right, so let's briefly go over the different types of way to select a sample randomly. So the whole point of selecting a, a random sample is that you want it to be truly random and you want it to represent the population. So the first way to do that is with what we call a simple random sample. A lot of times we just abbreviate this SRS. In a simple random sample, every possible group of size N has a chance to be selected. So let's say that we wanted to select a sample of 50 people. Any possible group of 50 people must have a chance. So if you have a population of, you know, all adults in the United States, any possible group of 50 has to have a chance. 50 complete random strangers obviously would probably come up most often, but even you and your 50 family members, or you and your 49 family members, that group, even though that would be a very, very unlikely group to randomly be selected, but that group needs to have a chance. The easiest way to do a simple random sample is to give everybody a number, in the entire population, maybe use a computer number generator to randomly pick out 50 numbers and those 50 people get picked. You could think of it like putting everybody's name on a piece of paper, putting it into a hat and picking out 50 names. That's how you do a simple random sample. All right, stratified random sample. Here, you break your population into groups that are very similar within. Then you randomly select individuals from each group. I capitalize each there because that's the key. So let's just say you're going to break your population down into age. People that are 18 to 28, 28 to 38, 38 to 48, 48 to 58, 58 to 68, 68 to 78. So you break everybody down to these groups based on age. Then you go to each group and you randomly select out maybe five people. It's again, whatever you want, but you randomly select out a couple people from each group. You can create as many groups as you want, but the key is once you create these groups, you have to take some people from each group. We call these homogeneous groups because each group is very similar within. They all have some common characteristic. Now, what characteristic do you stratify on? Well, that's based on what your problem is. You know, maybe if you're doing a problem that has something to do with vision, then maybe eye color. So you're going to break your population down into the different eye colors, uh, green eyes, blue eyes, brown eyes, whatever, and then take a couple people from each group. The key is taking some people from each group. All right, cluster random sampling. Here you're going to break your population into groups that are very diverse within. We call these heterogeneous groups. You want to create groups that are already a very nice mix. So each group you create is already very mixed up, right? It's all very, it's already very diverse. Then you label your groups and you randomly select one or more of the groups to be your entire sample. A lot of kids get stratified and cluster mixed up. Just remember with stratify, you have groups and you take a couple people from each group. Where cluster, you create groups and then you take one or two of those groups randomly to be your entire sample. All right, the last one here is what we call a systematic sample. Systematic here is your population is already pretty mixed up, whether it be a list or whether it just be people walking into a building or something, and then you randomly select every kth individual. And again, the K could be whatever you want. You can maybe select every fifth person, fourth person, whatever. So if I want to do a sample of people attending a baseball game, maybe I select every fifth person coming into the baseball game. All right, now the key question that you're often going to see is why is systematic, cluster, or stratified not simple random? Well, the key is that in simple random sample, every group of N must have a chance to be selected. So if you stratify, now all of a sudden you eliminate groups from being selected. For example, if I uh, stratify based on age and I take a couple people from each age, I'm never going to get a group of all people in their 20s. That group becomes impossible because I picked a couple people from every age group all the way up to the hundreds. So a group of all people in their 20s never has a chance. Whereas in a simple random sample, even a group of all people in their 20s that would be really, really random and very, very unlikely to occur, that group still has a chance to occur. 
Same thing with the cluster sample. If I break into these diverse groups where um, there's no way that all African Americans can be selected because you already have these groups that are very diverse with different races and different ethnicities. So a group of all African Americans never has a chance. And that is why they're not simple random. Even systematic, right? If, if I walk into the baseball game with me and 10 friends and they every, and they only select every fifth person, well, there's no way that myself and all my friends are going to be selected. We'll never be, have a chance. But in a simple random, hey, maybe luck has it, me and all my friends get picked. I doubt that'll happen, but there is a chance. Okay, the key thing is all four of these, the sample must be random and you really are preferring that your sample represents your population. All right, now let's talk about bias. Bias is anything that could allow the sample to not represent the truth of the population. So any way that your sample doesn't represent the population or it doesn't represent what you're looking for, right? So if I'm trying to take a sample to get the average height of people, if the average height is, say, 5'8", and my sample produces an average height of 6'8", well, then clearly I was probably sampling NBA basketball players, which doesn't really represent all people across the world. So anything that allows the truth to not really be found properly could be bias. The most popular form of bias is simply called selection bias. Here, your selection method results in a sample that does not, sorry for the typo there, does not represent the population nor the truth you seek. So basically, selection bias is this giant umbrella. Anything that can happen that results in your sample not representing the population, that's selection bias. Now, oftentimes, selection bias will produce what we call over or under representation, meaning a group is either over or under represented, represented in the sample. You know, very common the example probably every stats teacher uses is picking phone numbers out of a phone book. Well, if I select my sample by picking names out of a phone book, what happens if you don't have your name in the phone book because you have a cell phone, you don't have a landline. You know, large amount of youth now don't have landlines, they just have cell phone numbers. So the problem is all of those people who aren't in the phone book instantly are underrepresented because they're never gonna be picked. People with landlines are overrepresented, okay? Convenience samples are also terrible samples. Any sample that's selected purely out of convenience, like maybe I'm selecting some high school kids, I'm just gonna use the kids in my classroom because it's easy, it's convenient. Certainly that's not random. The kids in my classroom are not a random sample of all high school kids because they weren't selected randomly. Also, asking for volunteers is a terrible way to do a sample. If I want to do select a sample and see if a group of people could pass a physical fitness test, and I ask for volunteers, who do you think is going to volunteer for a physical fitness test? People that are physically fit. So what's going to happen is it's going to make my sample look like, hey, everybody could pass this physical fitness test. That's because I use volunteers. People who aren't going to pass the physical fitness test certainly are not going to volunteer. So you should never use volunteers if you want to get a nice representative sample. Okay, moving on here. Let's talk about a couple more forms of bias. The next form of bias is called non-response bias. Here, some of the individuals selected never respond. So basically, maybe you have this great selection technique and you produce this awesome representative sample, but then 20 people just never never respond. They, they never step onto the scale to get their height or measure their weight, or they, you never, they never give you the answers to your survey questions. Who knows? They just never respond. This could be a major problem because maybe they're not responding for a meaningful reason that actually makes them different than the people that do respond. Well, if we never get their responses, we're never going to learn what that meaningful reason is. So the point is if people don't respond, you need to get them to respond. Maybe you offer them an incentive. Maybe you call them, email them, visit them. You got to do something to get their response. You don't just go and ask other people. A lot of times people say, oh, just ask another 20 people. No, that's not the way to fix non-response bias. If they got picked, they need to respond. All right, next up is response bias. Now, a lot of people think response bias is the opposite of non-response bias, and that is not true at all. Response bias is anything that can cause an individual's response to be untruthful. So response bias, again, happens after the sample is selected. So if you have this great random sample, but you maybe social desirability, this is where you ask a question 
in a large group setting and somebody might lie because they don't want to look bad in front of their friends. So like if you're doing a survey on drug use and you ask everybody, okay, raise your hand if you do drugs. Well, maybe people are going to lie. They're just not going to raise their hand because they don't want to admit in front of all their friends or in front of their teacher, you know, that they do drugs. So they don't want to put themselves in a position to look bad. So they're lying. That's response bias, right? Maybe just who's asking. You know, I use the classic example when you go to the dentist and the dentist says, hey, do you floss your teeth? Usually I say, yeah, of course, I floss every day. Well, come on, that's not true. Unfortunately, I don't floss every day. But the point is because who asked me the question, it made me lie. It made me change my response. Even a broken scale, if I'm just measuring the weight of a sample of rocks, right? Well, if the scale I'm using to measure those rocks is broken, then the response I'm getting from those rocks is a lie. Also, wording bias. Maybe the question is worded in a way that elicits a certain response. So never give any um, like leading words in a question. So if you have a question that says, how do you feel President Trump is doing right now? It should be that simple. Don't say, you know, I think President Trump is doing a terrible job as president. How do you feel he's doing? See, that's giving a leading phrase that could change somebody's response. So make sure that your question is worded very simple and very straightforward. All right, let's look at a very simple example here. So here's one of these questions where you have to pick which type of sampling method was used. So a school principal wanted to investigate student opinions about the food service in his cafeteria. The principal selected a random sample of 50 first year students, 50 second year students, 53rd year, 54th year students. Which of the following best describes this sampling plan? Well, hopefully you got it right. If you want to pause and try it out, that's fine. But it is a stratified sample because he broke the school down into freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. And then he took 50 of each. So the fact that he broke them down by grade, which is something that they all have in common within each group, and then he picked 50 from each grade. That makes it stratified. Simple random, you could get 200 freshmen. All 200 freshmen would be a really weird sample, especially if it was completely random, but a simple random sample, a sample of 200 freshmen has to have a chance. A cluster sample would be if he purposely made diff, like let's just say that there were four lunches, okay? And each lunch had a mix of freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors. And instead of just selecting 50 kids from each grade, which is stratified, he randomly selected one of the lunches and surveyed every kid in the lunch. That would be cluster because he already had four groups that were already a diverse mix of all the grades. And then he selected one of them to be his entire sample. Convenient sample would maybe just be asking for volunteers. Hey, you know, I need 200 people to volunteer. Or maybe just grabbing the first 200 kids that walk into the cafeteria one day. That would be obviously biased. And then systematic would be if he, you know, waited at the front entrance of the school building one day and surveyed every 10th kid that walked in the door. All right, now here's another type of problem where you have to decide how could you do a simple random cluster or stratify. All right, so these are nine floors of an apartment building. And each floor has four apartments on it. And you'll notice some of the apartments have children, and those are marked with asterisks. So if I wanted to get a sample of eight apartments, okay, that's my goal, is to get a sample of eight random apartments. Okay, simple random, SRS, simple random sample. I could use the apartment numbers, use a calculator to randomly pick eight apartment numbers. Or I could put the apartment numbers on a piece of paper, put them in a hat, randomly pick out eight numbers. That would produce a simple random sample. Could I get all first floor and all second floor apartments in my sample? Yes, I certainly could. That would be weird, but it could happen because in a simple random sample, any group of eight has a possibility of happening. All right, how could I do a stratified? Well, there's several different techniques I could stratify. I could stratify based on the floor. I already have nine floors, and I would have to take one from each floor. Now, that would produce nine apartments, but you know what? That's fine. Who cares? I got nine apartments instead of eight. But that would be stratified. They're already grouped into something similar, right? Everybody's on the third floor. Everybody's on the sixth floor. Everybody's on the ninth floor. And then select one apartment from each floor. That would be stratified. Another way I could stratify is break into apartments with kids, apartments without kids. So I could do with kids, without. And it's okay that it's not evenly balanced. That's fine. So I believe there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine apartments with kids. 
and that would leave, let's see here, nine times four is 36 total apartments. Um, 36 minus nine is 27 apartments left. Okay, so, all right, so maybe I take randomly two apartments with kids and six apartments without kids. You don't have to take the same number from each group, but in a stratified, you do have to take some randomly from each group. And since there's only nine with kids, maybe I only take two apartments with kids, and then, like I said, six without. That would be stratified. It broke into groups, took a couple from each. Now, what would a cluster look like? Okay, uh, and I spelled cluster wrong. Jesus, oh man, I'm trying to go too fast here. Sorry. A cluster sample. Well, maybe the floors are the clusters, right? So I have a, you know, nine clusters, and I'm going to randomly select two floors, and all apartments on those two floors will become my entire sample. So see, stratified based on floors, I took one apartment from each floor, from each, that's stratified. Cluster is, instead of labeling all the apartments, I just label the floors and I select two floors to be my entire sample. Two floors would be eight apartments. That would be a cluster sample. Now, the drawback of a cluster sample, the negative there is what happens if the third floor and the sixth floor are picked? Well, then all of a sudden, I don't have any apartments with kids in my sample. And maybe it's important to have apartments with kids in my sample. So that's probably why this technique right here, stratifying, would produce the best sample because it would guarantee me some apartments with kids and some apartments without kids. Whereas if I just pick two floors, maybe floor three and floor six get picked and I get no kids in my sample. So there's plus and minuses to all. Cluster is usually faster because you just select two floors. There you go. You don't have to visit every single floor like stratified. You don't have to separate based on children or not. But again, there's a, you know, advantages to all of these things. But the key thing is you need to be able to identify how to select different samples in an example like this. All right, so that's a quick, easy video that covered just how do you take samples and how do you avoid bias. And hopefully you guys can ace a question that comes up like this on the test.